So to kind of to talk about carbon, I have to talk about photosynthesis. So here's a little review. Um, you've all had gen bio, so this should come as a review for you. Normal photosynthesis is called C3 photosynthesis. And the reason is that plants take CO2 in and they convert it into a three carbon sugar, okay? Through the Calvin cycle. Now they use an enzyme called Rubisco and uh, Rubisco can discriminate against using the heavy CO2. And so when a heavy isotope of CO2 comes in, it can be like, no way, I'm not using that. And so it's not gonna be converted into the plant's tissues. That is different though than C4 photosynthesis. So C4 plants um, take up CO2 into a special mesophyll cell. And in that cell, there is no Rubisco. They convert the carbon dioxide into a C4 sugar. And then they take the C4 sugar into the bundle sheath cell. Um, and then from there, they convert the C4 sugar back into CO2 and they run the carbon cycle to create their C3 sugar. Now, the problem with the C4, I mean, the, the good thing about the C4 pathway, the reason that it exists is that plants can, they can let CO2 in to their stomata and then they can convert all of that CO2 into C4 sugar and then they can shut down their stomata. They can close their stomata so they don't lose water. And while that's happening, they can be converting their C4 sugars into, in, or C4 into C3 sugars inside um, these separated in space cells, okay? So it allows plants to fix carbon then transfer it to an internal cell for sugar production. There, once it's there, that CO, that carbon has already been, it's already entered. And so now the Rubisco just has to deal with it. It doesn't like to, but it can't be choosy because it's all it has. And so there the Rubisco can't discriminate against the heavy CO2. And so C4 plants are gonna take up more of the heavy CO2 than C3 plants. This um, C4 pathway requires more ATP but it is more efficient in terms of photosynthesis. And these plants are an advantage under high temperatures and low water. Um, they tolerate drought stress much better and they can close their stomata against water loss. The only problem is they can't get rid of that C, that heavy carbon dioxide. And so they end up with higher C4 values or less negative, uh, sorry, C13 values. CAM plants are similar. They take up CO2 during the night, they convert it into that C4 sugar. And then during the day, they convert it into the C3 sugar. And so um, CAM plants are also not able to be as choosy about using the heavy isotope. So um, this is important because a lot of epiphytes like pineapple and other plants that grow um, and have phytotelmata are C4 plants. And so are a lot of aquatic plants and succulents. So the interesting thing about this photosynthetic um, enzyme Rubisco is that it provides us with kind of a chemical tracer. We can use carbon 13 values now to tell whether a plant is a C3 plant or a C4 plant or a CAM plant. This and CAM plants are a little bit messy. They're like all over the board, but C3, C4 distinctions are really great. And you can see that the C4 plants are, there's less of a difference between the C12, C13 value. They're less negative. There's a big difference for C3 plants because Rubisco can discriminate against that. So plants prefer to take up 12, carbon 12. Rubisco prefers to use carbon 12. All plants have low carbon 13 values, lower than the atmospheric concentration. But in C4 plants, PEP carboxylase doesn't discriminate. So then the Rubisco just has to deal with it. Okay. And what's neat about this is not that we can tell whether a plant is C3 or C4, but we can tell what other organisms are eating, whether they're eating C3 or C4 plants. And so, you know, are you eating um, wheat bread um, or, uh, or like, yeah, are you eating corn versus some kind of wheat, right? So those could be two different types of plants and they have different um, carbon isotopes. You could tell what, what kind of, uh, food an organism is eating. So another thing is that um, carbon isotopes fractionate because of water use and light. So high light increases CO2 use, which can lead to higher or less negative delta C13. Nitrogen also increases enzymatic activity, which can lead to higher or less negative C13. Internal damage to a plant can actually cause um, 
more C13 or low values and water stress plants can't be as choosy and so they end up with higher or less negative C13 values. So an example is you could ask um, a water stressed tree, um, that's a better example as a C3 plant would be a tree, not grass, but um, in fact, I think grass is a C4 plant. So uh, a tree, say you're eating like cashews uh, versus corn, corn nuts, right? So would a water, what would the C13 values for a water stressed tree be versus corn? And could you tell them apart? So that would be example number four. You could try that out on your own. So there are some carbon isotope differences for um, different types of things. So things like um, carbonates and fossil fuels, concentration in the atmosphere versus phytoplankton and seaweeds and seagrasses. And so these can be really helpful in food web studies to try to understand um, the different types of carbon sources because carbon is what a lot of organisms eat. And so it's great for food webs. Okay, so C13 in food webs means you are what you eat and the C13 in your tissues is reflected in the C13 of what you've been eating, your food resources. So it's just a direct relationship. And this is even true for extinct animals. So here we have um, mastodons versus mammoths. And so people can take mastodon tissue and mammoth tissue from ice samples or from, um, you know, like, yeah, if, as long as you can get a tissue, piece of bone, um, fur, something that you can take, take a sample of. Uh, what you can see here is that based on the C13 value shown on Y, it shows that mastodons were feeding more on trees than mammoths. Mammoths were feeding more on both trees and grasses. And so we can see what totally extinct organisms were eating based on their carbon 13 values. And um, I'll talk about mixing models a little bit later, but basically there's, there's some mathematical models that you can use to try to tease things apart when an organism is eating more than one thing. In aquatic systems, it's a little bit more complicated because we're not talking about plants, right? Um, but we're talking about algae. Um, sometimes we're talking about detritus. So the detritus that comes into an aquatic system typically has a terrestrial plant signature. Um, phytoplankton, because they can bounce around in the water column, they can bounce around and they can avoid the heavy isotope. So they tend to have um, a really negative difference. Of the, so they don't have much of the, the heavy isotope. Whereas benthic algae are stuck with the heavier C13, they're stuck to the surface. And so they just have to take whatever CO2 comes toward them. So I like to talk about beggars can't be choosers. Um, and so for example, five, you could make a comparison between a benthic algae and, um, and a plankton. And what would the C13 values be? So here we can see that food webs um, could be, basically we can tell whether a food web is relying on phytoplankton, like a lake is relying on phytoplankton swimming around in the water or the periphyton growing on the bottom of the lake. And so we can calculate these things like percent pelagic reliance based on the C13 values. And so we would have really low, um, really negative values for the phytoplankton. Again, they can bounce around and avoid the C13 value, uh, the heavy C13 versus the periphyton might not have such a low value. And so that can help us kind of build these food webs. But we're still missing something. So, um, well, and, and we're gonna talk about a lochthanus leaf litter. So if you had algae, um, periphyton and phytoplankton, and you also had some leaf litter coming in, where would you put that leaf if it had a terrestrial C3 signature in your, in your food web? So try to do that one. And then this last bit, the trophic position on this graph, you can see that has to do with N15, and that's the next one. So to get a complete picture of the food web, we need to learn about N15 isotopes. N15 is the heavy isotope of nitrogen, and it bioaccumulates in tissues. So higher trophic levels have a three to five per mil higher N15 value 
And um, what's really cool about this is it can be used as a marine marker. Marine food webs are much more complex. And so they end up with more trophic levels. And so they end up with higher N15 values. So if you're studying a stream system and you wanna know how much of an influence salmon, like returning anadromous salmon from the sea have on the system, you can look for these N15 values, which would be really high. And they come from only possibly salmon, um, salmon derived nitrogen. So for example, build a new food web where you have algae, an eagle, a minnow, a predatory dragonfly, a lake trout, and a grazer on your graph and try to, try to put them in order based on their nitrogen 15 signature. <clears throat> so here is kind of an example. Um, you might have the, the algae at the bottom and then you have the zooplankton and the tiny little um, you know, invertebrates and then the tiny little fish and then the top fish, right? And they're all bumping up as you move in the trophic level. Here's another example. Um, say you have, you know, short food chains with just zooplankton and lake trout, or you have an intermediate food chain where you have zooplankton, a forage fish, and then lake trout, or you might have zooplankton, a mycid shrimp, forage fish, and a lake trout. So in all of these cases, that lake trout might have a slightly different um, nitrogen isotope signature because the complexity of the food chain um, is longer in some of those systems. Okay, so the cool thing about carbon and nitrogen together is the carbon tells you you are what you eat and the nitrogen tells you where you are in the trophic position. And so in combination, they actually provide this two-dimensional picture of a food web. And so see if you can figure out how to put all of these things on your plot. Benthic algae, terrestrial leaf litter, grazers, clams, minnows, and an eagle. And see if you can build a two-dimensional food web. You can pause the video if you want. Okay, so here's an example. These food web diagrams, this is from Fry 1991, can show you like ep epilithophyton, that's paraphyton, and um, particular organic matter. Um, Carex is a type of an emergent plant. And then you have copepods eating those things and then fish at the top. Versus in a stream, you might have alder, fir, um, so terrestrial sources coming in with algae, and then calves and stoneflies, and then salamanders and trout. So you can kind of see the flow of nutrients and energy through these systems. And it could be that in the stream here shown here that the, the allochthonous organic matter resources aren't really feeding the food web because the stoneflies and caddisflies look like they have more of an algae signature. Then you can also study what happens when you introduce a new species to a food web. It can change the whole structure. So you could create what's um, kind of a classic study, flathead lake food web. If you have plankton, zooplankton, minnows, lake trout, and bald eagles. Okay, so you can ignore a lot of inputs in this case. And then um, add mycid shrimp, which are a big um, invertebrate that feed on the zooplankton but then they migrate vertically during the day to avoid being preyed on by the fish. So how would that change the food web? That would be example number nine. Okay, so just a few more examples. I just love this stuff, it's so exciting. Um, Dr. Lolita Calabria and I are working with her students on a project looking at stable isotopes in a moss cyanobacterial symbiotic relationship where the cyanobacteria that grow in the moss help with um, nitrogen fixation. So they're fixing nitrogen from the atmosphere. So there's all this really cool fractionation according to the nitrogen cycle that we'll talk about in further lectures. And so a nitrogen fixer might have a different nitrogen signal than um, a denitrifier or a different type of organism. Here's an example from nature where we, um, not we, but the scientists were able to trace um, ivory from these seized poached collections of ivory back to its source. So where where did the where was the elephant living? And they were using 15N and they're using a stable isotope of strontium in the ivory to figure out where they were from. So this is another example of ecological forensics. 
Here's another one. Um, ecologists were asked to help determine where the coca leaves were coming from um, in this cocaine that um, was being shipped from South America. And so you can using, um, in this case, nitrogen 15 and carbon 13 isotopes, you could actually tell the region of South America that these coca leaves were coming from, that I guess they were eventually gonna be used to make cocaine. Stable isotope analysis is really cool because it's time integrated. So like I said, you know, like different types of tissue, um, like your hair, you can measure through time, but things like your blood um, is much faster or muscle tissue would integrate over a much longer period of time. So depending on what tissue you select, um, you might be analyzing different time period. It's getting at what's both digested and assimilated. It can be relatively inexpensive for scientific analyses. $9 a sample is pretty inexpensive. It might sound expensive to non-scientists, um, but it gives really broad resolution, um, which can be good, but can also um, be bad. So it's not always super specific answers. And um, it works best in pretty simple uh, food webs. So it does get complex in omnivorous ecosystems or om omnivorous systems. Um, the other thing that's really cool is you can you can measure these things on museum specimens so you can look at changes going back through time using museum collections. Um, and like I said, omnivory confuses stable isotope analysis, but we can also use lots of different stable isotopes to get at questions that are more complicated. So mixing models can help tease apart mixed diets. They are really messy and I'm not gonna go into how they work ex explicitly, but um, you can also use multiple isotopes to help answer your question. So you can look at nitrogen, you can look at carbon, you can look at hydrogen and oxygen, and all of these things can help answer your questions. You can also look at specific types of molecules. So things like fatty acids and lipid analysis, especially in conjunction with stable isotopes can really help describe food webs. And so things like fatty acid methyl esters, phospholipid fatty acids, these are measured on a GCMS or a GCFID. Um, and you can also do stable isotope probing of DNA. So you can get at the stable isotope concentration of the actual DNA molecule. And so we can really just only recently are we able to look at stable isotopes of individual bacterial cells or individual fungal cells, which is really exciting. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna go over the answers to the stable isotope workshop real fast. So if you're irrigated with groundwater, you're going to be slightly more negative, okay? Um, clouds and atmosphere, atmospheric water is going to be much more negative than the ocean in terms of, um, I think that was hydrogen. Here, if you're looking at um, deuterium, you would have the ocean, you'd have, oh, sorry, this is oxygen, I think. You would have the ocean and then rain would be slightly more negative and the atmosphere would be much more negative. Um, if you were to compare a water stressed tree to corn, it would be really hard to tell them apart. So because of the water stress, the tree is not able to um, discriminate as much as it normally would. And so a normal tree would be down around negative 30, but if it's a water stress tree, it's gonna look like a C4 plant. Okay, phytoplankton can discriminate more than paraphyton. It looks like lettuce, but it's a it's supposed to be a paraphytic algae. And um, Terrestrial tree would be somewhere in the middle, so around negative 30, negative 25. And here's kind of a big food web showing nitrogen going up. Okay, so the paraffine to the grazer, to the invertebrate predator, the little fish that eats invertebrates, the bigger fish, and the eagle, right? If you had um, grazers eating paraffine and bivalves eating organic material, you might have the fish eating both the snails and the bivalve, and the eagle might have a signature that's representing both of these sources of carbon. And then here, if you have this um, kind of normal, simple lake food web with phytoplankton, zooplankton, little little fish, bigger fish, eagles, but you add a mycid shrimp that eats all the zooplankton and then avoids predation by the fish, you might end up with the fish moving to some other source of nutrients like snails and benthic um, paraphyton. Okay, so you get this decoupling of the food web. Okay, moving on to the next lecture.